Good morning. Great to see everybody. Glad you're here on this. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful Sunday day, so I'm so glad we can be together uh, to worship. Alan mentioned, remember, next Sunday we're going to have one service at 11 a.m. I encourage you to be here. Uh, one, it's just always uh, wonderful spiritual energy when we're all together and worshiping God. Uh, also, we're going to have baptism, and that is just a high moment in our church. We have a couple, of Mary and uh, Mark. Uh, they're not with us this morning. They're, they've gone out of town for this weekend, but they'll be baptized uh, next Sunday at 11. Now, I will give the invitation if you want to, at the end of the service, as we're singing, uh, maybe you've been thinking about baptism. I encourage you to do that if you know, you believe that, um, that Christ is the Son of God, that uh, he died for your sin, that God raised him from the dead, and you believe that in your heart. And the Bible says that uh, Jesus really wants you to follow him and his example of baptism. So maybe um, that's believer's baptism. That's baptism where when you've known that in your heart, you follow through, and uh, we baptize by immersion. And um, it'll be a great experience, the next step in your faith. So think about that. If uh, you've been contemplating that, uh, you might as well be baptized when the water is in the tank. It's a lot, it's a lot harder when it's not. <clears throat> so we'll have water in the tank uh, next, uh, next Sunday. So you be praying about that. Uh, this Sunday... We are talking about, of course, the disciplines of the disciple, and we're going to talk about praying in faith today, praying in faith. We've talked uh, a few weeks ago about there being a difference in just reading, opening up the Bible and reading it uh, for enjoyment or for just basic knowledge or, or that it's great literature or you know you should read your Bible, so you, you just occasionally read it just to make yourself not feel as guilty. There's a difference in that and living in the Word, letting the Word uh, affect uh, your mind, your, your heart, your everyday life, and just loving the Word of God. <clears throat> well, just as there's a difference in that, there is a difference in uh, occasional prayer, occasional praying or um, maybe um, you know I pray I, you know I, I remember I pray before every meal I pray at bedtime <clears throat> or when I'm at church I, I bow my head and I, I pray along <clears throat> when the pastor's praying or when there's quiet time those are important times of prayer but there is a difference in the disciplines of the disciple of that occasional praying and praying in faith praying in the faith where just like reading and living the word praying in faith is that you develop this trust and this um this faith that god is hearing your prayers you're being guided by this prayer time with god and, you know, I get questions as pastor through the years about prayer and uh, all kinds, but a lot of the questions I get are, are things like this. Some will say, I want to pray, but I don't know what to say. I had someone just ask me that a few weeks ago here. I don't know what to say when I pray. Or how do I even begin a prayer life? It's... it's uh, it sounds, it feels, and it sounds so difficult. Or how can I have more faith in God and prayer? I want to, but how do I do that? So let's talk about praying in faith today versus, you know, just those prayers that we occasionally say. So let's begin with the end in mind. Here is an awesome statement of where the disciple of Jesus, where we can aspire to grow towards. Jesus says this in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 7. Jesus says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, 
ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Wow. <laughs> that's impressive. That's, that's all-encompassing, it sounds like, doesn't it? Ask whatever you wish, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, and it'll be done for you. Don't we want that type of confidence when we pray? Well, to have that kind of confidence, to, to grow to that level, there are some biblical truths we need to look at. Now, the first one is, and we talk about Jesus doing whatever we want when we pray, what Jesus is saying and what he lives out in his life is that praying in faith to the point where we ask, where we're just in tune with Christ, where we are more in tune with God about what he wants us to pray for. And so praying in faith is learning to pray according to God's will. There's the key. Learning to pray according to God's will. Let's look at two examples from Jesus' life. Jesus, the disciples ask him, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gives them what I call the model prayer. Many of us call it the Lord's Prayer. I think the Lord's Prayer is more over in John 17. This is the model prayer. And in the midst of that model prayer, Jesus says, in your prayer life, in your time spent with God, learn to pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. We've prayed that most all our lives, haven't we? Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Versus Jesus doesn't say, Lord, help my will to be done. <laughs> Lord, help my kingdom come. Lord, help, help things all work out where it's just great for only me. That's not what Jesus says. I think sometimes our prayer life can gravitate towards that a little bit, can it? We can, we can start praying for... Um, even deeper than just our Christmas list. You know, of course we want to pray, God, give me this, give me this, give me that. But we can pray sincerely for good things to happen in our life. But still, Jesus says, don't work towards that. Work towards praying, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. He says, in another part, which we quote often, what Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added unto you. You see, there's a sequence there. Now, another point where we see, well, Jesus, that sounds good in, in asking us to pray that way, but Jesus gives us an ultimate example of where his relationship with the Father and his prayer time became and got to the place where that really happened in his life as a human being. And we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane, don't we? Jesus is praying the, the night before. He knows he's about to get arrested. He knows that he has known now that God's plan is for him to be the suffering servant. He knows by now that he is going to be sacrificed, that he is going to die and that it's going to be by crucifixion. And uh, he prays earnestly. In fact, he says, Lord, um, the selfish part, if it's any other way that, that we can get this done to save the world from their sin, may this cup pass for me. He prays that, doesn't he? If there's any other way, let, you know, let, let it, I don't want to go through this. I don't want this to happen in my life. But then... Uh, because he's grown in his prayer life with God, he says what? But not my will, Father, but yours. Not my will, Father, but yours. That's praying in faith, isn't it? That's growth in our prayer draws us closer to God, where we want God to change us, not us to change God. We're growing in our prayer life where we seek God's will. Now, once we get to that point or we move towards that point, it's something that I don't think any of us will ever get to 100% to, will we? Because we're people. 
you know, where we're men, we're women. We, you know, we, 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 you know, just that natural person just filters in. But you can see the, the deeper that relationship grows to where we're praying God's will and not our will, then when Jesus says, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you, we're, we're more praying for what we want God to happen in our life and in our world. And those prayers become maybe more spiritually realistic. They're matched up with God. So we need to learn and grow to pray for what God wants, what his will to be. I read an illustration, uh, a moderate extreme illustration. There was a couple from North Carolina, very affluent area of the Lolly area, which is a beautiful area. He was an executive by this time, making a very large salary. The wife, his wife, was a college instructor who was finding great meaning in her work, moving towards, you know, uh, already there maybe with her vocational dreams. Yet the, they left and all of a sudden quit their jobs, sold most of their possessions, and as a couple, they departed for Asia where they began working for a humanitarian organization in order so they could share their faith much like the Puerto Rico pastor was doing in a very difficult part of the world. And they said they made this move as a result of praying in faith for God's will to be done in their lives. That's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? Now, this doesn't mean that if you pray for God's will to be done in your life, He's going to ask you to move overseas, okay? <laughs> don't, don't let me, you know, freak you out with that. But it does beg the question about our prayer life, how deep it is, how sincere it is, how meaningful, how real it is when we pray, thy kingdom come and thy will be done. And it begs the question, are we really ready for God's answer, for God's will and God's kingdom to be lived out in our life? That it's a serious prayer. But it's the prayer God wants us to pray. And this is the first move towards praying in faith, is wanting God's will to be lived out through our lives. And you know, and you do know when that's happening, I know. Well, also, praying in the faith is centering the presence of God. It's entering the presence of God. How do we get to this point? How do we take the next step? Well, the next step is learning in our prayer time to enter into God's presence. That's when we're going to sense that's when we're going to feel. That's when we're going to recognize God working in our lives and around us. And uh, as we often say, that's how we're going to hear God speak to us. We need to learn to enter into the presence of God when we pray. What are some of the ways we can do that? One way that, that, that I do that, and I think that many of us do that, is that we learn to meditate, going back to the Word of God, learn to meditate on the Word. We read, we read the Word again for knowledge, but sometimes we need to read the Word and pray the Word. I think one great thing to do that all of us can do is go to the Psalms and pray through the Psalms, pray through one Psalm every day. Not just read the Psalms, but pray, and you, you'll discover that these great psalms of worship and these great psalms of poetry are prayers, the deep prayers of people who follow God very closely. So you could almost read a verse or two of the psalm and stop and go back and pray that verse or pray those two verses. Relate it to your life. But take time in your prayer time, if you want a guide, 
Go to the Psalms. There are, I mean, you can, you can pray through any of them. And you'll be amazed if you look at those Psalms um, and as prayer, how close you'll begin to enter the presence of God. Ask God, ask God to reveal his presence to you. Just in your prayer life, that's something, how do I pray? What do I say? One thing we can say is, Lord, reveal your presence to me today. Reveal your presence to me today. And then spend some time in silence. Sometimes you'll say, what do I say in prayer? And, and, and oftentimes, I think all you ought to include some moments, some minutes in prayer. One answer is don't say anything. Listen. Be quiet. Quiet your mind. Quiet your body. Quiet your soul. Let God, the scripture says, still your heart. And when our hearts become still and our mind and our body become still, we can have that exchange of conversation with the Almighty in greater ways. So meditate maybe on a psalm. Ask God to reveal his presence. Spend some time in quiet, in silence. For some of us that like to talk a lot, that's hard to do. I know. I'm there. You know, for some of us that have a little adult ADD, I know I'm there. It's hard not to let that, that mind wander. So what a great discipline to try to do. Spend some time then in praise and thanksgiving. Thank God for his great character. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for salvation. I don't know what to say in prayer. I don't know what to begin. Those are some things. Just spend some time thanking God, praising God for what he's done, for what he's done for you, for, for what he's done in your life. And, and I guarantee you, you'll think of some words to say. This is... This is the time of prayer, the beginning of prayer, when, when what we're doing is we're, we're worshiping the Heavenly Father when we do all these things. We're worshiping God. And then the other things that you need to talk to God about, I think, are going to flow more naturally. What you're struggling with in life. What you need to ask for forgiveness about. Uh, what you really want God to be a part of your life to be about. What, what are your needs? He wants to hear them. But you're going to have a deeper sense of that if you can first enter in this time of worship. Uh, when we find ourselves in, in the presence of God, it can be a powerful thing. Listen to just the beginning, and I encourage you to go back and read more of the sixth chapter of Isaiah. But what when Isaiah goes basically the church and, and his nation is grieving because one of the great kings has died, King Uzziah, and he goes to a, this worship and he's looking in on the temple and he enters the presence of God during this worship and it really turns into some powerful things. Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. That's what Isaiah was experiencing in his thoughts, in his mind, in his soul. And, and after that time of worship, if you go on to read that passage, after that, uh, Isaiah is, is, feels compelled to confess. He says, I'm a sinner with unclean lips. And he confesses. And then after that, God calls him. After that, God calls him to what he wants to do, to preach the word, to share the word, 
but it began with entering the presence of God, entering that time of worship. And then what this, hopefully, this progression is going to lead to is we want to be able to pray in faith and when we pray in faith, it's praying in confidence. We want, our, we want our prayers to God to be confident because of who he is and because of our forgiven relationship with him. And we can pray in confidence. Back over in the New Testament in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and verses 14 through 16, uh, the Hebrew writer tells us one way and the reason why we can pray in confidence to Jesus and in his name. He says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. As we learn to enter the presence of God and pray within his will, that's when our trust and our confidence in God will grow. It's when we're confident and trusting that we begin to realize uh, God is there in our times of need. God is there to guide us into his will. God is there to listen to our cries. And Hebrews 4 reminds us of that. He, Hebrews says, that we, we can have this confidence, one, because Jesus is our high priest who intermediates with us to the Father. Because of what he's done on the cross, he is with the Father, and our prayers in Jesus' name go straight to God, and God hears that because we've been forgiven. And when we pray to Jesus, he can empathize with our struggles. He can empathize with our weaknesses. He can empathize with our temptations because he had those weaknesses. He had those human limitations. He dealt with temptations of sin. And he conquered all of that, didn't he? To not sin and to do the perfect will of the Father. So he's experienced it and he knows how to have victory over it. That gives us confidence. And because of Jesus, that's why we can approach God's throne in prayer. And we know God is there to hear us. We receive mercy and we receive grace, especially in our time of need. And don't we really want that with prayer with God? In our time of need, we want that mercy and we need that grace. We may not be getting it from anyone else or anywhere else. We can have confidence we can receive it from God because of what Jesus has done. Um, at the time when I really felt the presence of God come in uh, into my midst when, when I was really discouraged, I, I think I've told you before about my 9-11 Ground Zero experience, but we had gone... Uh, to uh, downtown New York with the Disaster Relief Feeding Unit. We were there uh, on the 13th of September, just two days later. We were set up in a big old parking lot uh, from the uh, Brooklyn Naval Yard. Right across the East River was Ground Zero with the buildings burning and collapsing still and the smoke coming up. And uh, it was uh, the largest operation I had ever done. Looking back, we've done some larger ones, but in the moment, it was pretty. It was laying pretty heavy on me and the responsibility. We had, uh, you know, 50, 60 volunteers from Virginia there. We had just as many or more Red Cross there. You know, that parking lot was filled with our cooking equipment and tractor trailers all around. 
uh, with vehicles all around and then with security all around because everybody was fearful about what might happen next. And at times it was a very overwhelming uh, moment where I often ask in the midst of that, God, why am I here? <laughs> you know, this, you know, I'm not sure I'm up to this. And I remember uh, one um, late morning, I had walked kind of on the back of the lot back to where the river was, looking over to uh, Ground Zero there. And uh, the phone rang, and it was one of my colleagues. He's passed away now. Uh, Wayne Coley was his name. And he said, um, you know, uh, how, are you, how are you doing there? And I said, well, you know, Wayne, well, we're set up. We're doing well. We, we just uh, cooked uh, 5,000 meals that we're sending over to Ground Zero to feed people and the workers there. I said, you know, but it's, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty tense place. And, and he, uh, he stopped and he said, kind of repeated that. And then he said, I'm at the end of a morning session and prayer breakfast at a church and we've been praying for you. And we, everybody was just, just now cheering that, you know, God's working through you and, and, uh, and are able to do these things through Virginia Baptist. And we just wanted to let you know that uh, you're in our prayers and that God's with you. And I mean, immediately in those moments with all that going on, I said, man, that is the word I needed to hear. And I just had this peace go over me and this peace come into my heart that, you know, I'm not in this alone. Not only are other people praying, but they're praying and God is here with me even in these, these very tense moments when it's hard to see God or feel God, thank you, God, for coming through, um, you know, coming through this stress, you know, coming through this weight of responsibility, these moments, and giving me peace to let me know that you're there and that your will is being done. We can trust and have confidence in our prayer life that God hears us, especially in our times of need. And I know that I experienced that on that day. Uh, what does maybe this prayer look like? I kind of want to finish up today by reading you a, a written prayer. It's by one of my um, favorite uh, spiritual um, fathers or saints that's gone on before us. Uh, this is from A Cry for Mercy by Henry Nowen. Henry was a... Uh, uh, a Catholic uh, priest, and uh, but he, he really uh, focused his life in the area of spirituality and prayer and drawing close to God. So uh, Henry is saying this, uh, his prayer, Listen, O Lord, to my prayers. Listen to my desire to be with you, to dwell in your house, and to let my whole being be filled with your presence. By none of this, but none of this is possible without you. When you are not the one who fills me, I am soon filled with endless thoughts and concerns that divide me and tear me away from you. Even thoughts about you, good spiritual thoughts, can be little more than distractions when you are not their author. Oh Lord, thinking about you, being fascinated with theological ideas and discussions, being excited about histories of Christian spirituality and stimulated by thoughts and ideas about prayer and meditation, all of this can be as much an expression of greed as the unruly desire for food, possessions, or power. Every day I see again that only you can teach me to pray. Only you can set my heart at rest. Only you can let me dwell in your presence. No book, no idea, no concept or theory will ever bring me close to you unless you yourself are the one who lets these instruments become the way to you. But Lord, let me at least remain open to your initiative. Let me wait patiently and attentively for that hour when you will come and break through all the walls, all the walls I have erected. Teach me, O Lord, to pray. Amen. That's the depth 
of prayer that I think going back to the end in mind that Jesus is talking about when he says, if I and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. We have to find the presence of God before any of that can happen. That's praying in faith. That's my prayer for your prayer journey and the depth of your prayer from this time forward. We're going to pray and thank God for his word in just a minute, sing a song of worship. And as um, I ask in the beginning, has God moved you? Has he moved you to action today? Maybe as you think about prayer and in your prayer time, you, you know, you, you, you realize that that Jesus is real, the Son of God, the Savior, your Savior. You need to let us know that you've asked him in your heart. You need to follow him in baptism next week. I want you to do that. Maybe you've done that a long time ago. That's what Mary and Mark have done, but they said we need to follow him in believer's baptism. We need to have this outward symbol of what Christ has done in here. I want you to do that. Or maybe it's a time for you to pray through this song. It's a great way to pray. And um, it's good, good father, that, 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 that the father is good. And uh, God, let me, let me draw close to you so that I know your will. I know your will for my life. That's a great prayer to pray during this time as well. So let's enter into this time of prayer and this decision making. And uh, let's ask for God to move in our life and the life of others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word does not come back void. And Lord, as, as your word now touches the heart of your people, may you give them courage to respond. Lord, to, uh, to ask you in their, in their heart for the first time to let us know about that decision, to be baptized in your name, or just to pray to draw closer to you and to worship you during these moments. Lord, thank you for this time we've had together. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.